good evening for and for spending your time in this afternoon with us. Um, thank you for all for joining this afternoon, um, uh, joining the Maryland Public Health Association for this very exciting and very timely town hall that will address the current state of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Maryland. Um, my name is Kelly Umania, and I'm serving as a board member for the Maryland Public Health Association, um, which is the organization that is sponsoring today's event. Um, before I move into today's program, I just wanted to give a big shout out to our fantastic members of MDPHA, Jessica Dayal, Ali Diorio, and Dalara Rajabi for their immense amount of service and support to plan this event for National Public Health Week. Um, our theme today for National Public Health Week is building COVID-19 resilience. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, as you may see on your screens, we have enabled closed captioning so you can adjust the subtitles font size by selecting live transcript um, and you will see a setting button to adjust, adjust this. Um, also, we are encouraging all of our attendees of today's event to keep your videos on if you would like. Um, please also keep your microphones on mute throughout the panel presentations. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of today's presentations where you will have the ability to unmute yourself to ask our fantastic panelists your questions. Um, you can also type your questions in the chat box during the Q&A session. Our team will be also providing um, a lot of technical support throughout the presentation. If you find that you are unable to unmute yourself, please raise your hand and one of our tech members will work with you to unmute you. Uh, we invite you to join to also join our live tweeting where we will be posting quotes, comments, and pictures throughout today's presentation. If you'll be participating, we do ask that you use our hashtag, hashtag MDPHW and tag our Twitter handle at MD underscore PHA. We have a fantastic lineup today for our panelists presentations from all across our beautiful state of Maryland. We have Dr. Brooke Meyer from Frederick County, Delara Wajabi and Jacqueline Turner representing our communities here in PG County and Montgomery County, as well as Dr. Bruton sharing the perspectives of her FQHC that are serving these areas. We also have Dr. Duyarala who has a family practice in Poolsville, Maryland. As mentioned, we will be having a Q&A portion at the end of today's presentation. Now, without further preamble, it is it's such an honor and privilege for me to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Anita Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins is the Associate Dean for the School of Community Health and Policy and the Director of the Graduate Public Health Program at Morgan State University. She has over 30 years of experience in the field of health and human services, working with public health agencies, healthcare organizations, institutes of higher education and community-based organizations. Dr. Hawkins has also played a critical role at Morgan State University and monitoring the campus's COVID-19 response plan. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for moderating today's session. I will now turn this over to you to open today's event. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, let me say welcome to all of our participants and especially to the panelists who are joining us today. I'd really like to express my appreciation to the Maryland Public Health Association for organizing this event. I look forward to learning a lot from the varying perspectives of the panelists, as well as from the questions that I, I hope that our participants will pose and engage in our town hall. I think this, this event is an excellent opportunity for all of us to be reflective of what's happened over the last four months um, and see what has transpired and discuss what actions must be considered for the future. And it is most appropriate for us to be having this conversation during National Public Health Week and on COVID-19 resilience, uh, building COVID-19 Resilience Day. Um, I'd like to start by just sort of sharing some information that might provide some temporal context for today's discussion. Um, the panelists have more information to share around their experiences. So it's just been four months since the first emergency use authorization uh, was granted by FDA on December 11th for the Pfizer vaccine. And within 24 hours, um, the first deliveries for the vaccine were made on December 14th. That was followed by the authorization in December 18th for the Moderna vaccine and then more recently in February, 
um, the emergency youth authorization for the J&J COVID-19 vaccine. So we've had a lot to do in this time period. Um, shortly after, well actually before the emergency youth authorization, um, CDC had already developed its plans around the priority author, well, the prioritization of who was going to get the vaccine. And all the states had developed their vaccine plans. As a matter of fact, the Maryland, um, Maryland's state vaccine plan was delivered to CDC in October, two months before the vaccine was first delivered to um, the state of Maryland. So what's been important once the distribution started, um, so it's been, um, let's see, once the distribution started, we began to hear issues even with planning. So despite planning, um, Maryland did have problems. So some of the problems that were brought to mind were concerns about inefficiency in terms of the delivery and distribution system, but inequity in terms of the delivery and distribution system and inaccessibility issues. We weren't the only state who were grappling with these issues, but right now we're gonna talk about what happened in the state of Maryland and see what we can do with what we've learned. So since December, over 3.5 million doses have been distributed to uh, Maryland, and this includes all three um, vaccines. Of those 3.5 million, 3.2 have actually been administered. And that means at this point now, 20% uh, of the Maryland population have been fully vaccinated. So where do we go from here? More recently, now, after all the prioritization, the groups, some of the concerns around who got access to, all Maryland adults are eligible to register for the, to be vaccine, vaccinated. So we're at this point now. We're not in a queue waiting list, except for we're waiting to get appointments. Right now, given the rate of allocation and distribution, if we continue at that rate, the current rate, even though in the past several weeks, we've actually had more allocations to the state of Maryland, it will still take to the fall to actually um, administer enough doses for to, to uh, vaccinate the entire Maryland population. So there's more to be done. Some of the issues still are, how do we get more people, how to get more vaccines into arms? And how do we address the issues that still might be um, accessibility issues in spite of the fact that everyone's eligible, there still may be accessibility issues and equity issues. With that, I'd like to turn it over to reviewing first experience over this past four months, looking at starting with the perspective of a local health department. So in this case, looking, turning to Dr. Brookmeyer, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Brookmeyer. Dr. Brookmeyer is the lead health official for Frederick County, directing the seven divisions and numerous programs of the Frederick County Health Department. She previously served as a deputy health officer on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and Somerset County and Dorchester County. She's also worked as a family physician in the migrant and community health centers in both counties. Her commitment to public service led her to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, where she developed policies to increase the availability of primary care clinicians and other health professionals in underserved areas, enhance the diversity of health professions and improve the quality of health care. Dr. Brookmeyer earned a Bachelor of Science degree in toxicology from Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, her medical degree from Hanneman University, and a Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins. We're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Brookmeyer about how she experienced as a health from the health department's perspective, the rollout of the vaccine. Dr. Brookmeyer. I thank you, Dr. Hawkins for that introduction. Next slide, please. Um, so I think it's important just to take a look at where are we in terms of the whole virus too. Uh, and when we look at where the United States is, you can see where we are with the cases and the deaths. 
Um, so the United States is high up there and vaccination is extremely important uh, for us. The next slide. So when we look at the states, you'll see that the areas around Maryland, uh, Maryland is the green line where we've gone up. But if you take a look at our neighbors, Pennsylvania and Virginia, where a lot of people either go to for recreational pur purposes or maybe coworkers live, work there, visit there, uh, their um, uh, rates of community transmission are still rather high, but you can see how it really varies state by state. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is to give you some grounding again. So Maryland, what are we looking for in the trends? So the, this is what's on the dashboard that the state has available every day. And uh, the first is the percent positive by jurisdiction. And then the, and then the other one is the case rate per 100,000. So that's for the, all of you in the public health, you know that the case rate is also uh, something that makes it much easier for us to compare jurisdiction to jurisdiction to better understand the burden in the whole population. Of course, what this doesn't tell you is the burden that is specific in other populations. And you know, I, I'm here talking about the rollout, but uh, we could easily spend uh, much more time talking about uh, the equity and who's been most impacted so far by uh, COVID. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, so when we look at where does vaccine play a role? Well, vaccine is part of the many layers of the protection that uh, the protective measures that are available for us to reduce the potential for an exposure to result in an infection. Um, uh, so I do want to remind folks that vaccination is extremely important, but we do have other measures that up until vaccination are very important. And uh, with this vaccine are still important uh, even after vaccination. And I'd be happy to talk about that more in the uh, question and answer period. So the next slide. And I apologize for going fast, but there's a lot to cover. Uh, so when we look at the vaccination rate per 100,000 population in the US by states, this gives you an idea of where have people been vaccinated uh, more. And so the darker uh, colors are the more vaccinated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Maryland, this is an idea, the, excuse me, this is the information about the vaccinations by the Maryland residents and Dr. Hawkins has already addressed that. Next slide, please. Uh, and then if you wanna look county by county in Maryland, so these are the residents of the counties, not necessarily who the counties have vaccinated uh, because uh, hospitals, for example, and health departments and the mass vaccination centers are vaccinating people who live and work in other jurisdictions. But this gives you an idea by jurisdiction in Maryland, what's the percent of the population that's fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated means it's been at least two weeks since their final dose of vaccine. So if it's a one dose product, the J&J &J Janssen, that's one dose, so it would be two weeks after that, or the Pfizer and Moderna, which are a two dose series, it would be two weeks after that second dose. Next slide, please. And as Dr. Hawkins had mentioned, that the governor had announced this week that beginning April 6th, all Marylanders 16 and older are eligible for vaccination at the state mass vaccination sites. Um, and uh, this upcoming Monday at all vaccination locations, persons would be eligible. Um, but I do have to say that there just isn't enough vaccine for everyone who wants to be vaccinated at this time. Next slide. So looking at the Maryland vaccination rollout, I would say that the vaccination rollout began long ago. It actually began before the fall of 2010, but the fall of 2010 is when we had H1N1 vaccine. And H1 vac H1N1 vaccine at that time went out to the obstetricians, went out to the pediatricians, the health departments, and the uh, internal medicine practices. Um, we had a similar situation then where vaccine was in short supply early on. And then pretty soon we got to a point where we had a lot of vaccine and very few people interested. So we only had uh, really November and December of a lot of uh, interest and a lot of vaccination clinics. And then it trailed off after that. But part of the reason is that with H1N1, it turned out that while it spread relatively easily, it wasn't making people sick. Uh, or seriously ill the way that we're seeing with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's one of the things that makes a difference. Uh, the other thing though, back then is while we had talked about with uh, the um, uh, H1N1 virus, about three feet of separation from other folks and then maybe six feet, um, the clinics, um, we could hold clinics and locations 
where we weren't attending to people's physical distance. And that really presented a significant challenge when it came to the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, and the vaccination clinics, because all of a sudden, all the other locations we had previously planned and all the other ways and strategies that we had planned to uh, reach people and also give people access to our locations were now no longer options that were available due to the concern about uh, people being in close proximity and shared airspace. Next slide. Um, and then the, just an idea of uh, uh, early on, just really that box one there for people to take a look at. So what did the CDC put out in their interim playbook in October of this year? Next slide. And then, so here's, you know, more of the timeline. Uh, and Dr. Hawkins had already gone through that. I would say then that the her first hospital workers vaccinated December 14th and local health departments received 100 doses a uh, couple days before uh, the uh, Christmas and uh, the uh, state government buildings being closed uh, for the holiday. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just for the people who are interested in maybe some of the academic sides of things, but this is what we have seen before in terms of vaccine interest and the way we've approached uh, thinking about it in phases where early on, not enough vaccine, a lot of interest in it. And then, then we have hopefully a good match of a lot of doses available and a lot of people who are interested, but we do expect that soon the interest will trail off and it'll be much more difficult to find people who still wanna be vaccinated uh, and we will have plentiful vaccine. And I sure hope we get to that point sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. Uh, Maryland has a COVID-19 vaccine plan. So for people who look at the slides later, you can see what the components are. I did want to say that the plan addressed uh, allocation, priority groups, and communications outreach. Next slide. So when we came to the original rollout, these were the, the groupings. There was just a 1A, a 1B, and um, uh, the approach was taking a look at the federal recommendations, and then the state also looked at persons who are at higher, highest risk for COVID-19 disease and complications. And then they also wanted to preserve the critical healthcare capacity. And that's why healthcare workers were first, because of that critical healthcare capacity, and then why residents and staff of the long-term care facilities were next. Because when we looked at the deaths that were occurring, uh, at least in Frederick County, they were predominantly persons who were over uh, age 70 and almost uh, all were in the long-term care facilities. Next slide. Uh, but when we talk about, okay, how long is it going to take till we can get the population? Well, this just shows you here for one health department. So our population is about 260,000. Well, uh, we're getting, you know, when we get less than 2,000 doses a week or even the highest this week, 2,000, well, actually, it's not the highest. We've received higher, 2,700 doses. If you've got a population of 260,000, it's going to take a long time to get there. Um, next slide. Um, but the Maryland local health departments, I have to say, in addition to the vaccination, we're still managing and delivering the personal protective equipment supplies. We're operating testing clinics. We're conducting case investigations and contact tracing and uh, providing technical assistance on outbreaks and responding to compliance issues. Next slide. Uh, this is later for people who want to know how do you sign up. The state has a website. Next slide. And uh, phone numbers, which were important. So I do have to say local health departments, we started pre-registration lists uh, before the state had. Uh, so back in January and also established phone lines uh, again back in January so that uh, folks who weren't you know, able to or comfortable in accessing internet would be able to actually speak to somebody uh, and schedule their appointments. Next slide. Uh, another really important point is Marylanders cannot be billed personally for the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, there, when you go to a vaccination site, they might ask for your insurance. Insurance is permitted to be billed. I think docs now, I think the reimbursement rate is $40 a vaccine, $40 a shot. Uh, and the insurance companies must pay the bills from the vaccination administration, but people don't have co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, that kind of a thing. Next slide. Uh, and then the primary care providers, uh, let's see. So the week of January 11th, I think the federally qualified community health centers started to receive their first you know, 100 doses. And then the week of March 19th, 
primary care practices. So we surveyed in Frederick County, our residents, what's your interest in being vaccinated and where would you want to go? 81% of the respondents said, we want to go to our primary care providers. So that's helped me to advocate since the very beginning that um, our, our community members have said that they would feel most comfortable receiving the vaccine from their primary care providers. So I'm excited that like Dr. Dubarawa and then others in, Fred and in Frederick County, we actually gave vaccine to one of our providers early on because he said, you know what? In addition to my patient panel, I'm willing to vaccinate anyone in the community. Uh, and then so uh, because of that willingness to be able to vaccinate anyone and not just the folks in his practice, we did make vaccine available. Um, next slide. And pharmacies. So, you know, uh, now it's almost every pharmacy, it seems, including some of the independent pharmacies, but not all of them have received vaccine yet from the state. Next slide. Uh, some key things to know. Uh, uh, CDC has a great website. Uh, if you type in, you know, COVID key things to know, you can pull these things up. Next slide. And there's still more that we are learning about the vaccines. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about that during the Q&A. Next slide. Uh, and then, so this is, it didn't come across well. This is from the state's website, their dashboard. Uh, if you uh, look down at the bottom, there are tabs and that's how you can see race and ethnicity. So this slide and the next slide uh, for persons who've been vaccinated. And even though you can't see the print, I'll tell you the first one was race, the second one is, is ethnicity, and you can tell that there are big differences. Now, these are numbers, it's not the percent of the population, but you, for Maryland, these are big differences, uh, significant disparities uh, in who's been vaccinated. Next slide, please. Uh, and so I think the challenge for all of us is how can we build back build back better, build back with equity at all levels. And so I thought it was stated really well from Invest Health, so I have to admit, and so that's why I'm giving them credit here, that I like their questions, so I included them in the slide. Next slide. Uh, treatment, monoclonal antibody treatment. Uh, there are effective treatments that can help keep people out of the hospital. Uh, so if you know people who test positive, who have symptoms, please ask them to talk to their healthcare provider about monoclonal antibody treatment and whether it's appropriate for them. Next slide. And that's because we're seeing significant race and ethnicity differences in terms of the, at least in terms of who's um, uh, receiving the monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, there's a lot more that we can talk about that, but for another presentation. Uh, next slide. And where are we going? This is just to show uh, over 30 uh, modeling, uh, model projections, where might we be heading uh, into the spring with the numbers of cases nationally? It's difficult to say. Looks like we are nationally at least expecting to go up. Oh, I'm two minutes over. I think uh, if you would scroll to the end, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brookmeyer. Um, for giving us that uh, very detailed overview of, of what's been happening. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to um, learn a little bit more from about what really happened within the health departments themselves as the rollout uh, occurred. Uh, next on our panel is Ms. Dalara Jabi. Uh, Dalara is a sophomore undergraduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. She's majoring in public health science and is currently interning with the Maryland Public Health Association. She works as a, at Patient First in Silver Spring as a front desk representative and has been a healthcare worker since November, 2020. Uh, she received her vaccine in January and has helped family and friends access the vaccine. I'm looking to hear from you, Delara, you know, Delara about your experiences um, as a healthcare worker, not only obtaining the vaccine, and then how you've been able to um, share that experience with your family and friends. Delara? Thank you so much, Dr. Hawkins, for introducing me. Hi, everyone. My name is Delara Jabi. And as Dr. Hawkins mentioned, I'm a sophomore right now interning here at MDPHA. And I will be talking about my experience as a healthcare worker, working the front desk at Patient First, an urgent care center located in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I'm really excited to be here to talk with you all today about my experience with receiving the COVID vaccine, its challenges, and my family and friends' experiences with its access, as well as their hesitancies. So I received my first dose of the Moderna vaccine in January 
around the time when Pfizer and Moderna first became available to healthcare workers since we were in phase 1A. And I remember being extremely frantic, refreshing the vaccine consent website page over 100 times to secure a spot for the vaccine. And after two weeks of trying, I was finally able to secure that spot. And then I was notified a couple of days later that they shut down that clinic site because too many non-healthcare workers had signed up. And so this was the first issue that I had faced. There were too many people that did not know what phase of the vaccine we were in, and many were misinformed or just not educated with what was going on and with the administration of the vaccine. And I was really confused at the time. And like even now, um, how some people at, at that time were able to get vaccinated over those that actually needed the vaccine when, they're, when they were not at high risk of COVID, like some of us in healthcare were. And it felt really unfair and worried me as I knew of friends in hospitals contracting COVID, like um, many of those that were working as like nurses and medical assistants, and they had not been able to receive their vaccine yet, while some people were finding ways around the system and were being vaccinated. And this problem was also causing sites where the vaccine was being administered to close down. And patient first noticed that many of our workers were having issues with scheduling an appointment. So they sent out private messages to us with places to receive the vaccine. And they also let us know that we should not be sending out these vaccine links to those that were not in phase 1A, as there were people that were having issues with knowing what phase we were in. So thus, I finally received my vaccine early January and then my second dose in February. And during this time, I would hear a lot of my friends talking about whether they would even want to receive the vaccine. Some of my friends were hesitant because they felt that there were not enough clinical trials that had been done and it made sense, but uh, FDA did put the vaccine out for emergency authorization. So they wanted to wait to see how others felt before testing the vaccine themselves. So many would ask me about my symptoms after receiving the vaccine, I would tell them that I just mainly had arm pain. And even then, um, if not concerned about the side effects, they would still be hesitant due to family concerns and distrust with the government. And so I'm also part of a club at the University of Maryland known as Public Health Action and Civic Engagement. And we had a discussion about vaccine hesitancy last month. And during our discussion, I noticed that many of my fellow club members and their families that were hesitant about receiving the vaccine were also minorities, such as those in the Black and the Hispanic communities. And a lot of it had to do with their families influencing them. Um, due to reasons that we saw, especially in 2020, as there was a significant movement in the African-American community expressing their concerns with law enforcement and the police in America, there are many in the African-American uh, community that have distrust in the government. And so in our club board meeting, some of my friends were saying that their parents did not want them to receive the vaccine, but they would say things like, why would I wanna to listen to the government and take this vaccine when my people are being killed and disrespected? Or some would say things like, well, there might be a microchip in the vaccine. I'm not sure if I want the government controlling me. And um, these were some things we were discussing in our club meetings. And it goes to show that vaccine hesitancy and myths about the vaccine are big challenges that we have faced and we continue to face. And um, for those that want to receive the vaccine, it has also been a challenge as well. I would say, however, that it has become easier now that mass vaccination sites are available in places like uh, Baltimore M&T Stadium. And thankfully I was able to help my mother, my brother who has asthma and my father who's also immunocompromised to finally register for the vaccine as well as my grandparents. Um, however, every registration came with a lot of scheduling difficulties as the sites continuously crash and the appointments are booked so fast. Um, but we were able to overcome these challenges because we were able to use technology so well. And this brings me to the elderly population. That's another struggle that we see. Like my friend has a grandmother that lives alone in Colorado and she struggles with technology. So helping her register for the vaccine has been so extremely difficult as she's in another state and she's not so good with technology. And so that makes you think, how are people who are not good with technology or disabled people registering for the vaccine? What challenges are they facing and how can we make it easier for them? 
So therefore, um, there are many barriers to overcome when it comes to access to the vaccine. But I believe that Maryland has come really far now and many are being vaccinated now, thankfully that CVS, Walgreens, Giant, and all these pharmacies have begun to administer vaccines as well, which is so great. And we have all definitely had our struggles and have heard stories about others' um, experiences, but hopefully uh, with more people receiving the vaccine, we can soon reach that herd immunity that we've been talking about. And it's great that we're getting closer to phase 3A, phase three, um, where everyone will soon be eligible. And um, I hope that there will be much easier access to the vaccine. It's just one of our jobs as public health practitioners and professionals to properly educate those that are hesitant by using evidence-based information and facts to let them know of the vaccine's benefits and give some tips to those who are struggling with registering. I've been able to help a lot of my friends register and I hope that we all can be a help to those who need it uh, with the challenges that come with scheduling these appointments. Thank you. Thank you, Delara. Um, thank you for sharing your personal experiences and giving or illustrating for us um, what does it mean to see some of these barriers. For instance, you shared barriers for uh, about the elderly and thinking about technology as a barrier, um, as well as you mentioned hesitancy, which might be considered a, a barrier, but it might also be not a cue for us to just be better educators. So thank you for sharing that information. And I know we have some questions for you during the Q&A period. Now I wanna turn this over to uh, Dr. Sonia Bruton. Dr. Bruton is the CEO and president of CCI Health and Wellness Services in Silver Spring, Maryland. She has worked with community health centers at the state, national and site level since 1999. She served as the executive director of the North Carolina Community Health Center Association for eight years and has served as a programmatic and operations consultant within the Bureau of Primary Health Care and at specific health center sites. Dr. Bruton earned a doctor of psychology degree and master's degree in clinical psychology from Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And she received her undergraduate degree from UNC Chapel Hill. Dr. Bruton has much to share about the rollout experience from the perspective of a federally qualified health center. Dr. Bruton. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. I'd like to start by giving just a little bit of context, next slide, about uh, my federally qualified health center system and the population that we serve. As federal qualified health centers, our purpose and what we strive to do is to create a more equitable healthcare experience for communities made vulnerable by social, economic, and cultural barriers. So we serve everyone in the community. That's why we're put in communities to offer nonprofit primary care and other services, but we target those who are deemed to be underserved. Next slide. If we look at what that footprint has meant uh, last year, 2020, and these figures are impacted by COVID-19, this was active um, numbers from operating during the pandemic, we saw a total of 30,008 medical patients. We saw another 29,942 people participating in the women's, infants, and children's program for a total of just under 60,000 community members throughout Montgomery County and the northern portion of Prince George's County. In terms of the locations, we have six primary care sites that are in operation. We have one that we've disabled during the um, pandemic, five WIC sites and one dedicated dental site for a total of 13. When you look at who are the people that we serve, it's mostly women, uh, mostly those in the age group of 15 to 64, and mostly Latinx was 67%. If you look at our non-Latinx population, that 30% breaks down to about 15% that are African-American, 12% that are white Caucasian, 3% who are Asian, and another 3% that do not report that ethnic and racial data. In terms of our payer mix, 51% uh, of our patients are on Medicaid, 31% have no source of insurance, and then we 
cover uh, the rest of the categories from there with the next largest category being commercially insured. In terms of our services, we offer behavioral health, primary care, dental, we do the refugee health program, nutritional services, so a bevy of support for the community. Next slide. As Dr. Brookmeyer stated, we started with our COVID vaccinations in January of this year. And the first thing that we were up against was just a lack of collaboration with the state. So we received a vaccine supply of 100 doses, but that supply was very limited in terms of the need that we had, but also unpredictable. As time grew, we were actually the first federally qualified health center in the state of Maryland to join the Biden administration's community health center vaccine program. And we qu quickly found that though we were allowed to order the amount of vaccines that we needed to meet demands of our patient population, we were still bound by the state's phased approach of categories that could and could not be vaccinated. If you think back to the slide that we just saw, the majority of our population was below the age level that the state was allowing for vaccines. And what that meant was we had unlimited supply or maximum empowerment by the federal government that was pretty much stripped by the state of Maryland in the way that they were rolling out the vaccine. We had to then decide what were we going to do. We had the opportunity to order on a Thursday as anyone who's putting together a plan to vaccinate, vaccinate knows that you start making appointments the week before. And we didn't have permission from the state to vaccinate based on medical necessity or equity in our communities. Because in Montgomery County and the area of Prince George's that we serve, those were the area's highest cases of COVID-19 positives and the area where the biggest disparities were found. So we had to then decide, do we go ahead and order the maximum allotment, which for us in that time was a thousand. We felt that we had the capacity internally to vaccinate a thousand patients. We just needed permission to do so because those people were going to come from categories that the state had not yet opened up. Next slide. What we did was recognize that what we needed to do was go ahead and meet the need. That this was one of those civil rights moments as we decided that where we needed to just do what was right. And so we were able to vaccinate to date uh, about 3,700 um, members of our patient population. We will add another 1,200 by the end of this work week or the, the calendar week of Sunday. And then we have ramped down or reduced the number that we're doing on a weekly basis to between 400 and 600 while we waited for the state to catch up with their allowances and our ability. So we are now moving into like everyone else where anyone ages 16 and above who would like to be vaccinated has the ability to. And we are looking at what's next for us. And one of the big things that we need to do is to integrate vaccination into our regular patient visits so that it doesn't have to be a, a distinct and discrete event. We have underserved populations that still we are targeting our refugee health population. One of our lessons learned was that we need to be able to vaccinate households at a time and that the individual appointments are not as effective. To date, we have mirrored our patient population. Mostly women have been vaccinated. Latinx population at 67% followed in pretty mirrored measure the categories that our patients fall into. So we have found the work with the state to be not as collaborative as we needed. We have not been contacted from or had access to the equity task force that the state put together. And so we are still having to overcome the barriers that were originally put in place, the plan that the state executed, a plan that made perfect sense when there was a situation where there were not enough vaccines, but we didn't have the gubernatorial permission and the staff members who were willing to adjust that plan when populations or areas 
were in a situation where there was no lack, where we had the abundance and the ability to get as much vaccine as we needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bruton. Um, your experience, particularly from the Federally Qualified Health Center and the population that it serves, um, illustrates an area in terms of determining how we prioritize, what are the criteria for setting up the prioritizations and how that might contribute to inequities in the process. So thank you for sharing that experience and hopefully the lessons learned can um, improve it when we move forward. And I have questions, of course, when we come to that point. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dugarilla. Um, Dr. Dugarilla is a board certified family physician practicing in Poolsville, Maryland. He has been in practice in Poolsville since 2006 and has been the owner and medical director of Poolsville Family Practice since 2008. He completed his medical school at the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine and did his residency in family medicine at Georgetown University, where he also served as chief resident. Dr. Dugarala practices a full scope of family medicine, including adult medicine, women's health, pediatrics, minor surgery, mental health, home visits, home hospice care, and televisits. He is also currently the treasurer and executive board member of the Maryland Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Dugarella can actually share with us as more private practitioners are providing vaccines, his experience. Dr. Dugarella. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hawkins, and thank you to the Maryland Public Health Association for uh, inviting me. Um, if you can go to my slide. So uh, I'll speak real briefly first about our practice and where we're located to give you an idea of how we started. Uh, so we're a two physician practice. I'm full time and I have a half time other family physician and we're a pretty small office. We have a full time medical assistant, a part time registered nurse, a receptionist and office manager. So that's that's pretty much our whole staff. Um, the practice originally started back in 1990. I joined in 2006 and I took over the practice in 2008. Uh, we have about 1100 patients, um, about a third of which are over 65. So we have a slightly older population than a lot of family practices do. Um, so for any of you who do not know where Poolsville is, uh, it's in the western part of Montgomery County. Uh, we're in part of something called the Agricultural Reserve. So uh, the area around Poolsville is actually reserved for agricultural use only. So we're the only town in this part of the county, which takes up about a third of the county. Um, and the population is about 6,500, but there are some smaller communities around our area. And that's important because we're the only medical practice in the western part of the Ag Reserve. So this large part of the county, uh, we're the only uh, primary care medical practice. So we serve a lot of needs for the community. As you can tell from the things that we do in our practice, we do a little bit of everything. Uh, we kind of fill in what the needs of our community are. And that includes seeing uh, kids and adults, um, doing urgent care, uh, we do home visits, we do hospice care. And you know, over the past year, televisits and uh, COVID testing as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So we were invited to be part of the uh, pilot project. Um, we're part of the Maryland Primary Care Program, which is a Medicare program uh, in conjunction with the state of Maryland. Uh, so there's several hundred practices in this pilot program. Um, we started with uh, the COVID vaccine pilot back on March 15th. There were 17 practices that were uh, selected uh, in the entire state. We were one of those initial 17. Uh, the practices were, um, were picked based on the populations they served. So they were looking for underserved populations, including practices that served uh, African-American communities, Hispanic communities, and rural communities. So uh, because of our um, location in a rural community, we were one of the practices that were served, that were uh, selected. So initially we were given 100 doses a week. Eventually we're gonna be uh, increasing to over 200 doses a week, um, uh, actually starting next week when our first set of second doses start. Um, there was a bit of pressure when we first started. Uh, they told us uh, just a few days before uh, which vaccine we were getting and that we had to use up all 100 doses within the first week. Um, 
Otherwise, we weren't going to be able to stay in the in the pilot. So there was a little bit of little bit of pressure there. So in three and a half days, we were able to call up our our most high risk patients who hadn't had who hadn't been vaccinated yet, and get them all done. Um, and then after that, we were getting 100 doses a week uh, to keep going. Um, so the practices in the pilot, um, most received Moderna. Some have received the Janssen, the Johnson Johnson version. Um, so we're we are getting Moderna in our practice, and we're going to be getting that throughout the pilot. Um, I have to update this. Um, the the pilot started at 17 practices, moved up to 36 or 38, uh, and then over 50. And I believe this week they're actually over 100 practices. So they are continuously uh, increasing it. Uh, you can go next slide. So because of uh, the way our practice is in our community, what we decided is that we needed to open up this, uh, our vaccinations to anybody in the community who wanted it. After the first week, after we uh, got all of our older patients and high-risk patients vaccinated, um, we kind of moved it open to anybody in the community who met the current phases. Um, so what we decided was our office is too small to uh, vaccinate 20, 30 people a day and eventually over 50, uh, close to 50 people a day. Um, so we were able to find uh, an open uh, space a couple doors down from our office, which was, as you can tell in the picture, is up for lease. Uh, luckily, uh, they haven't found anybody yet, so we're going to be using it for the next few weeks, next few months. So we set up a whole online process for people to register. The patients that we had already had in our system, obviously a lot of our patients don't have access to technology. We actually called those patients individually and set up and did their forms uh, verbally over the phone and then set them up for uh, appointments. We also hired a part-time vaccine coordinator, a clinic coordinator who is setting up all of our appointments, answering emails, setting up um, uh, appointments both through our online process and through our electronic medical records. Um, uh, we're doing a two-hour uh, vaccine clinic daily from 10 to 12. As, as Dr. Brookmeyer mentioned earlier, these the, the vaccines for COVID are a bit complicated uh, and much more complicated than we had to do back in 2010 with H1N1 because once you open a vial, you have to use it up in a certain period. So we decided if we do a two hour block and if we have extra doses, we can call people up um, during that time. Uh, so right now the clinic is run by myself, either my MA or my nurse, and luckily a lot of volunteers. Uh, we've had quite a few medical volunteers, including uh, an RN, a couple of pharmacists, um, and a physician who are all helping us out, as well as several community members who are helping us with some of the non-medical issues with signing people in and documenting for us. Uh, without the help of all of our volunteers, uh, it would have been very difficult for us to run both of our, both our practice and our uh, vaccine clinic. We also partnered with a local nonprofit, um, which is helping community members sign up uh, through our online process. We don't have the staffing or even the volunteers to uh, individually fill out forms. And we, don't, we, don't, we didn't wanna do that in the practice itself. Uh, so uh, we, we um, partner with this community nonprofit and patients can call them and they have volunteers that will actually walk them through the online process or fill the form out for them and ask for the appointment and so forth. So that has been super helpful as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of the patients we did uh, in our first couple of days. Uh, the gentleman on the left is actually not one of our current patients, um, although uh, after our vaccine clinic said he wants to be become one of our patients, so that's great. He is uh, 95 years old, if you can believe it. He looks great for his age. Um, he was unable to get a vaccine anywhere. His neighbors were trying to help him out since he doesn't have internet access, and uh, they reached out through uh, to us through one of our other patients, and we said uh, he, you know, that we need to get him a vaccine. He's, he's like I said, he's 95, he's a veteran, fought in three wars, apparently. Um, so uh, we said, you know, this is what we're here for, for our community. Uh, people who couldn't, couldn't go to mass vac sites or travel long distances or manage technology, we were gonna fill in that gap for them. And uh, the lady uh, on the right, she is one of our patients. Um, also does not have technology access, and even though her family was trying to help her, 
uh, trying to get a vaccine. They were not unable to prior to us starting our vaccine clinic. So she was thrilled that once we got our shots and she was on our first day. So uh, she'll be coming in for her second shot uh, next week. Uh, next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, the importance of primary care uh, and family physicians in being part of the vaccine rollout. Um, you know, we as primary care physicians, as family physicians, we give vaccinations on a daily basis. So we're well versed in how to uh, store them, how to give them. Our staff is well trained in, in giving vaccinations. Um, also wanted to point out that Medicare data shows that primary care physicians uh, provide the largest share of services of vaccinations, much more so than even uh, pharmacies or um, uh, public health clinics. Um, the other part is we're also well trained in to deal with anaphylactic reactions. Um, you know, when all the information came out about, you know, possible anaphylactic reactions, although we haven't seen any with the vaccine, uh, we already give allergy shots in our office. We know how to deal with uh, giving epinephrine, uh, with CPR, and so forth. Uh, the other part is that primary care physicians, we know who our high-risk patients are. You know, um, we know easily, you know, because our practice is small, we know all of our patients, but even in larger practices, uh, it's very easy to find their high-risk patients through electronic medical records and, and run down lists and figure out who they are and call them up and get them in line to get their vaccines. Uh, the other important thing uh, is that uh, patients trust their physicians. Um, there was a survey that found that 85% of adults trusted their personal doctor. Uh, and this uh, is true no matter what their ideology is, what their, where they fall on the political spectrum. It's pretty much, a, pretty much very similar uh, regardless of that uh, because we have those one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships with our patients, they trust our, our judgment or our advice. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the other part is that primary care physicians and family physicians want to be part of the solution. Um, there was a survey put out by the Robert Graham Center um, that uh, stated that nine in 10 primary care physicians wanted to be a vaccine site for COVID vaccine. And I've seen that with a lot of my colleagues too. A lot of them uh, came into the pilot after us. Some of them are still waiting, but they're all very excited to be part of getting us back to uh, dealing with this problem. Uh, and as far as vaccine hesitancy, I know we talked about that. Um, you know, um, there are surveys uh, talking about that their most trusted source, 85% uh, of individuals would trust their, would go with whatever their primary care physician recommended. If their primary care physician recommended get, they, getting the vaccine for their individual situation, that um, they would rely on that information. So if, they, if, the, if, the, if their primary care physician is not only giving them the advice, but also can give them the vaccine, they don't have to go to an alternative site. For a lot of people who are uh, vaccine hesitant, this is a great way of doing it. Um, the other part is that we're already in the communities that need the vaccines. As we saw from Dr. Brookmeyer's presentation, you know, a lot of the communities that need the vaccine the most uh, don't have it. And even if they have a mass vac site close to them, that's not really in their neighborhood. Um, and primary care physicians are in the neighborhoods where uh, people need vaccinations. Um, so we not only know who the patients are, we know how to get it to them, we know uh, how to talk to them, and uh, we are local. Um, and that's my presentation. Uh, I know we're probably going to hold questions till the end, but again, I want to thank um, the Maryland Public Health Association for inviting me and having this uh, great set of speakers. Thank you, Dr. Dugarilla. One of the things I, I drew from your uh, conversation had to do with the importance of, of confidence and trust in, in the relationship with your primary care provider um, in dealing with any health issue. I think that was one of the things that you raised and um, an earlier presenter talked about um, People feeling comfortable about getting vaccinated and you address the issue of the level of comfort when you have a primary care provider. Um, so that given your experience um, in doing the pilot, it shows this is an opportunity for us to recognize 
the importance of primary care providers in just general health care overall. Thank you. Our next panelist, Ms. Jacqueline Turner. Ms. Turner is the mother of three adult children. Her youngest son, Zach, was born with Down syndrome. As a result, he has developmental, intellectual, and physical disabilities. Her career in volunteer service has both focused on addressing persons with disabilities. In November 2019, after 41 years of service with the U.S. Department of Justice, Ms. Turner retired as the program manager for the Assistive Technology Resource Center, where she was responsible for supporting DOJ's efforts to ensure that employees with disabilities had comparable access to information and communication technology as their colleagues who are not individuals with disabilities. Ms. Turner has also very been active with the Prince George's County, Maryland chapter of Parents of Children with Down Syndrome from 1993 to 1999. This includes planning and organizing the first annual Buddy Walks in Prince George's County. While our previous panelists spoke about healthcare system, provider and worker perspective, Ms. Turner speaks to the experience of the non-healthcare resident and family. Ms. Turner. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to see, let you know my co-presenter is Zach, yeah. so he's gonna help me out today. He, he's hugging one high. Uh, Thank you, hon. He um, may be coming in and out of the shot, but he'll be okay. So um, I am Zach's primary caretaker. And once we started hearing about um, COVID, I was very careful to make sure that if we did have to leave out, we had our mask, um, we had our sanitizer and gloves and um, any type of, we had this shield. And if we did have to go to the store, we came in and all of our stuff that we had on went straight into the washer and we jumped into the shower. I was still concerned about Zach getting COVID because of his developmental le levels, he would not understand what was going on. He, if he were to have to go into the hospital, if he was to have problems breathing, it, it would just be a very traumatic issue situation for him. And so I um, was quite pleased when um, the group, um, the priority group included individuals with intellectual disabilities. And so I quickly signed him up and his first dose was February 2nd. He received his second dose on February 23rd. But while I had a great level of relief with Zach receiving the vaccine, my, vo my focus shifted a bit and I thought, oh my goodness. Zach is vaccinated, or at least on his way to being vaccinated. But if I get COVID, what happens to Zach? You know, he would have, if I get, would have gotten COVID, he would be exposed to it. And so at that point, what family member would want to step forward and put themselves at risk to take, and their family to take care of Zach? The only family member that we had. I have an older son who was in law enforcement, so he was fortunately um, vaccinated. But if I were to get sick, he would not be able to go to work to support his family, and it would just be a problem with Zach. His day program um, wouldn't be able to take him, so we so a situation could have been an emergency situation could have been created because even though Zach was on his way to being protected, I was still vulnerable. Um, I did reach out to his day program because I had heard that other um, parents in my situation were vaccinated through their adult child's daycare day program. But our program only vaccinated the staff and the residential clients. So the day program, clients and their caretakers were on their own. Um, 
and, and that was very troubling, quite frustrating. Um, I reached out to several organizations, including um, the um, governor's office in hopes of someone being able to understand that they needed to have broadened the scope of people who were in some of the early phases, um, especially because there would just be no, nothing, I, I wouldn't know what to do with Zach. Um, fortunately, um, I, um, as the priority groups started to expand, my medical conditions put me in one of the groups. And so at that point, I could at least start scheduling, try to try to schedule my vaccine. Unfortunately, it was very difficult um, being able to schedule it because even though I was in one of the priority groups, the only um, site that had a category for me to check off on when you're trying to log online, you had to tell them what group you were in. The group that I was in what wasn't, sh wasn't showing up at the pharmacies. So the only group that I could go to would, was the health department. And um, that was frustrating. Um, eventually, I was able to connect with um, a couple of Facebook groups that are call themselves co um, um, vaccine hunters. And they helped me to be able to get an appointment. So I, I received my first appointment um, in early March and um, I'll be getting my second appointment tomorrow. But it was just really, a, it was a sigh of relief for me, but still I'm concerned about other caretakers, whether it's an, an adult with the intellectual disabilities, if they're caring for an aged parent, that they're still, their, their charge is still um, gonna be in a very, um, bad situation if the caretaker were to get ill. And um, that's all, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner, for sharing that information with you, our experience. Uh, we've listened to all of our panelists um, from different perspectives. I wanna go back and, and there are a lot of questions that have been posted in the chat group in addition to the questions that were um, forwarded to us when some of you registered for the platform. So I'm gonna to try to address these questions to for our panelists. Um, and I know there may be some additional questions as we move along. Um, there were a couple of questions before I, I do the preliminary questions. There were a couple of questions in the chat that I wanna group that uh, just for clarity purposes. And uh, the questions were around insurance and. and Thought the answer was was clearly given, but I think it needs to be um, stated um, around insurance, so that you're going through the you know the states either mass vaccination or approved vaccination sites, and they ask for insurance. You aren't billed; they will not bill you for the vaccination. Um, I know that has been a concern. I know for in our campus they were asking about whether or not people were gonna be billed if they, um, you know, when they were asked for insurance information. So if you don't have insurance, you're not billed. If you do have insurance, you know, the potential is your insurance might be charged, but the point is most places, the mass vaccination sites aren't even asking for insurance, but other places might, but they can't bill you. Now for panelists, that is, I wanna make sure I'm giving the correct information from your perspective as well, because you've, you've also said that information that they couldn't be billed. That is correct. The federal government prohibits it and the state of Maryland also prohibits individuals being billed themselves. However, their insurance can be billed and that's for the vaccine and for the vaccine administration and for any office visit just for vaccination. Now, technically, if somebody is at a doctor's office or a nurse practitioner is, is, in a, is in a healthcare provider's office for a purpose other than for the COVID vaccine or receives a service other than COVID vaccine, they can be billed for that other service. 
Um, and certainly we had seen that with testing. So some people had found themselves having rather steep bills for testing because while uh, the tests couldn't be uh, billed to the individual, the, uh, they were billed from any other services. Uh, but if the question is for the vaccine administration, for the vaccine itself, and for the, the well, I guess that's the basic part, uh, the federal government and the state of Maryland prohibits billing individuals. Thank you for, I just wanna make sure everybody got that because I did get several questions around um, the billing issues and insurance. So I'm gonna address some of the preliminary questions that were sent ahead of time. Um, and then I'll come back to the chat group and uh, we'll also continue to monitor the chat group. So if you have additional questions, by all means, you can type them in while others are responding or you can unmute yourself um, at certain points to be able to answer the question, ask and answer questions. Um, one of the things that we um, talked about or mentioned also where we are in this, in this stage that currently all individuals 16 and above are able to um, register now to be vaccinated. Dr. Brookmeyer also mentioned, yes, the issue now is not so much who's eligible, but do we have enough vaccines to, uh, um, the demand for, and the allocation for vaccines. So my question to all of you is, how will the state offering vaccines to all individuals 16 and above, uh, what kind of challenges will it create for the additional organizations? And how do you think we might address some of these challenges? I'll go start, if, I'll start first. For those of us that have pre-registration lists, it creates a significant challenge because we would like to honor those individuals who pre-registered uh, for their eligibility category uh, and had some expectation that their patient waiting would uh, uh, pay off for them in a way. And uh, so part of the challenge is balancing people's expectations that now that they're in a, in a priority group that's now eligible, well, what about all the people who've been waiting uh, and they were in prior eligibility groups? So I think the challenge is, is being able to honor what had been established as the priority list and that people more or less were willing to follow. I'll go next yes. and say that for us, it really just takes off the handcuffs. It allows us to move freely uh, with our population and it's opened up uh, additional partnerships. So we have now had outreach from insurance um, companies and Medicaid managed care organizations, as well as various groups representing specific populations who want to partner with us because as Dr. Dugarala said, the primary care practitioner, the person who they have seen for other things or recognize their credential um, are the most trusted source. We also have the advantage of being able to translate our materials into all of the languages that might be operating in our community populations so that people can actually receive the information about the vaccines and um, what to expect and a method that they can understand. We have the people that can help them fill out any forms that are necessary. And we never did use any of the electronic systems for registration or for getting vaccines from the very beginning. We recognized that there was a limitation on tools and time. You know, we didn't have patients who or represent community members who could actually expend the time that was required. So we already had eliminated all the barriers that we had the power to eliminate ourselves and the state opening it up to all with the 16 plus takes away the last bit of limitations that we didn't have the power to control. So we're, we're pretty thrilled with where we are. One unintended um, consequence that we have experienced is we were notified by the state that we would not be receiving vaccines from them at all next week. And so that unpredictability that we have been facing with the state partnership from the beginning seems to be intensifying as they have opened up the floodgates. Thank you. I have some questions also that were sent earlier. 
Um, and this speaks to, I think, one of the themes for today too was, what are the lessons learned from the vaccine rollout? You know, we've each of you, uh, you've gotten the opportunity to listen to each other and talk about some of the barriers and some of the challenges um, and the goals and the aims. But given the time that we've had, what are some of the lessons learned from this process that, for instance, mentioned that we didn't have to, we didn't have H1N1 to follow because it was very different. So with this process, what would we need to know now for anything similar in the future? I think to ask first before any policy or uh, program is put in place is to say, how is this going to impact communities of color? How is this going to impact people who don't have transportation? How is this going to impact people who are uh, uh, often left out? Um, you know, this is just uh, amplifying already structural imbalances and disparities that we already have in so many other areas. So if we take a look at who already has uh, is experiencing poor health outcomes, then we should say, you know, that should be a question. How is each policy and each approach, is that going to make it better or worse? Thank you. Any other comments on that from panelists? Oh, I was going to add that um, following on what Dr. Brookmeyer said, I think part of it is um, getting input from people on the ground, on the front lines. Uh, that includes the county health departments, primary care physicians, uh, local nonprofits, uh, even houses of worship, people who um, see the issues in health equity and uh, where the resources need to be laid down. I think if you're doing a top-down approach, sometimes you don't get to the most efficient way of getting to uh, getting to the people that need help. Um, and I think uh, the technology works great uh, when people can use it. And we have relied on that, but we also knew that there were lots of patients who don't have that access and we needed to figure out a plan for them as well. But I think talking to the people on the front line and seeing what their needs are and how we can reach out to those communities is, is I think something that we could use next time. And I think I would just add, uh, you know, I've had a lot of grace for uh, the state, the counties and all of us who were doing this for the first time. And we recognize that we're all just figuring out mass vaccination together and for the first time, but the communication um, could be significantly improved and the recognition of where the natural partners or alliances lie. I know that as we have found uh, the state and um, unequal and uh, imperfect partner, our county um, health departments have really stepped up and, and shown themselves to be great partners. And so to when that happens, to push the power where the results can um, be held. And then I think finally, just to follow the science and the data, I think that in the absence of some of the conversations that the data would have been a great director on what needed to happen with whom, when and where. I, I, I just like to add that when they are um, creating priority groups and with different organizations such as um, care providers for those with disabilities, they're the same type of organization should have a, the same or definitely a similar um, distribution plan that I shouldn't have to, that the, the um, population shouldn't have to go to one particular center has one set of rules and then another center has a different set of rules. So consistency between similar organizations would be helpful. That consistency you spoke about had to do with, again, the language about the priority groups um, the specificity vary um, under each priority group if you went. So the language at one center looked a little different than the language at another center. So you wouldn't necessarily know if you sort of fit into that group. And you're right. And that those, those guidelines were supposed to be standardized, but they didn't appear to be standardized. Right. Because some centers called their day program um, clients and told their care to bring it that a caretaker could receive a, their vaccine 
where in our situation, the day program client wasn't called and the caretaker could absolutely not get the vaccine, but they're the same types of organizations. So yeah, some consistency. Um, at this moment, I thought there's a couple more questions that are um, pre-questions, but wanted to find out if there's anybody in the audience who just wants to unmute and ask a question that hasn't typed a question before I go on to um, a question that's already been posted. Okay. If not, I know I have a couple of questions. Uh, well, one question that was really interesting that came and it's, it's directed to you, um, Dr. Dugarilla. And the question had to do with whether or not um, someone who's more politically conservative members of the community might be more likely to consider getting a vaccine um, if they're doing it with their primary care practice provider uh, than a county or run system. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my community, um, you know, there's a mixture of people of all diverse backgrounds um, and uh, possibly a little bit more conservative than the rest of Montgomery County. But um, what I have found is there's definitely vaccine hesitancy on both sides. And I do think that relationship makes a difference. Um, I have had patients who uh, are hesitant because of a more conservative viewpoint and uh, some of the hesitancy on, on, on from, you know, depending on their news sources and that sort of thing. And I do think that made a difference. Um, I've been able to talk a few patients into getting the vaccine, um, and including patients who've never get a flu shot, never get other vaccines. Um, and part of that had to do with, you know, talking to them, talking to them about them, about their, um, you know, hesitancy, what questions they have, and uh, kind of just walking them through it. And a lot of it really depended on the fact that, you know, I've treated them for lots of other things. And, you know, if they trust me on the other medical conditions that they have, that they would trust me on uh, my viewpoint on this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Several people have mentioned this and throughout our um, discussion, our presentations about vaccine hesitancy. So I'm, I'm going to ask a little different question because I think there's an assumption there's vaccine that we all agree what that is that we understand that meaning. Um, my question is how many how many well do you feel that vaccine which is a greater contributor to uh, the inequity in terms of vaccine um, you know acquisition is it hesitancy see is creating these differences or are there systemic issues that are creating these differences? My concern is sometimes that we look, use hesitancy as a, as a kind of catch-all for the reasons that people don't aren't getting is that they're not going to get them and they don't want to get them. And hesitancy doesn't necessarily mean you aren't going to get a vaccine. It may mean you just have some questions and I need to have them answered before I go get to vac vaccinated. Um, to answer that question, Dr. Hawkins, actually, like, as I mentioned before in uh, IUMD in our club meetings a lot, we discussed this a lot. We were talking about, is it really that um, they don't want to get it or is it just that they don't have enough information? And a lot of times it's because they don't have enough information about it. And a lot of times it's the myths and the misinformation going on. So one thing that I realized, like, the big problem with being the healthcare worker and trying to schedule my appointment was a lot of people didn't know what phase we were in. And now that's kind of a thing as well. And part of it is just the problem with like, um, the phases change so fast and not enough people are like informed about it. So like sometimes I'm even like confused when we just got into phase 2B and I wasn't, un I wasn't sure. So I feel like we need to do a better job with just informing people, letting people know what phase we're in, letting people know what the benefits of the vaccine are. A lot of it, I think, has to do with just the fact that people are not educated and um, receiving that education and understanding um, exactly what the vaccine is going to do for you can cause you to actually want to get it. Um, another thing I would say is also, like, as I was saying before, um, just more like the older generation, like, 
family members influencing younger generations or like things that you hear, um, myths that you hear also just with distrust in the government, why would I want to listen to them, right? What if there's a microchip or something in there? And it's a lot of times just like not knowing like the facts. one of the questions and comments that was kind of posted too was um, around how we can resolve the inconsistency when you spoke of uh, Ms. Turner around the standardization when they do prioritize. Um, well, one, I think Dr. Brookmeyer mentioned in the beginning is to first start off by listening so we can do a better job of identifying um, who's most vulnerable so that we can get more information before we make set policy in terms of the order in which or order in which vaccinations might occur, um, and the the person also mentioned the idea that distrust because of such inconsistencies, there may be mistrust in in government, and therefore that can be part of the hesitancy, not feeling confident. I would say that one of the things that we found was to your point that it might not be the traditional sense of hesitancy. We had people who um, were timing mattered for them. Um, they may have been um, actively trying to become parents and just didn't really want to introduce another substance into their body during this time. Um, in other instances for um, populations that broker back and forth between other countries uh, when they are interacting with their families you know, we're getting into a travel season that's pretty typical. Um, and the navigation of one and two doses um, was difficult uh, in, the, in the travel planning. You know, we at CCI, we keep a stock of the Janssen J&J &J for when somebody really can't come back for the, for the dose two, but we have to do that in a limited fashion as well. And so what I found was there are some people who needed to wait later because of things that were driving the decision about when the timing made the most sense for them. And I'm also um, clear that we still haven't penetrated deep into our patient population to maybe get to that level where the hesitancy will show up right now. We have people that are the opposite. They are wanting it, they're thankful for it. They ask us for buttons and stickers. They wanna take pictures after they finish their second dose so that they can post and on their social media. So for us right now, that hesitancy that people are ascribing to the populations that we're serving and those populations are the ones that they say have had limited numbers completed because of that hesitancy, we're just not finding that to be the case. I was yeah, oh, okay. saying earlier about systems issues. Um, you know, most of the patients that we're seeing now in our vaccine clinic, over 90% are not our current patients. They're actually members of the community. And uh, a lot of the reasons they've given us is traveling to vaccination sites, not feeling comfortable with going to a mass vac site because they're already concerned about social distancing, um, uh, transportation issues, uh, just comfort level of being in a, in a smaller place when they get their vaccine. So um, th th that those things include, you know, obviously trust issues, um, transportation issues, comfort levels. So um, there are definitely systems approaches of why people were holding off on getting vaccine or waiting for the right opportunity rather than just jumping on it, uh, even though they weren't necessarily uh, concerned about the vaccine themselves, they were concerned about the process. Any other comments? The, and the reason for um, asking that question, I would never duh, dismiss the idea that uh, there are those who are going to be reluctant to be vaccinated, even with information. They, they will have their reasons and uh, will not want to be vaccinated. We know, you know, across just from, you know, children's immunization, a variety of vaccines, people are reluctant to be vaccinated. So that's, that is a, a, a just a real uh, concern across the board. However, not wanting to um, highlight that as a sole issue when there were so many as, as 
all of you have mentioned, I know, and, and Dr. Brookmeyer focused on the, the systemic barriers to um, that have created some of the inequities that we see. And you each mentioned from technology, from not recognizing um, the uh, geographic accessibility issues, transportation barriers, uh, timing barriers, all of those things are significant barriers to um, reaching the vaccine in addition to just having sufficient um, allocation of vaccines to be able to um, administer. I am looking at the time and I know it is close to, I think uh, uh, the, the time for our town hall to shortly end. I wanna make sure I'm able to recognize everyone. Um, I'm looking for our host from the uh, Maryland Department, I'm sorry, Maryland Public Health Association. I want to make sure they have any closing remarks they'd like to, to offer. Yes, thank you. I'm so sorry. I had a big storm hit um, very randomly in my neighborhood, which shut down my Wi-Fi, but I was very happy to be able to be back on. Um, yes, I'd just like to thank um, every single one of you for spending this afternoon with us and our, I mean, Dr. Hawkins, thank you so much for your time and moder moderating this fantastic panel. Um, and again, to our incredible panelists who have shared their experiences, um, their perspectives, and just kind of really looking back as to where we were and where we are now and how we can really prioritize these lessons learned for future um, I hope no more pandemics, but you know, really understanding that um, they have been at the front lines of our healthcare and ensuring that our communities are safe and are healthy and are really striving to ensure that they have access and equitable opportunities to get their vaccinations. So thank you again. I appreciate everyone's time here. I just wanted to ensure that I highlighted this um, fantastic resources page. Thank you to our panelists who um, provided some of these resources as well. Um, this will be distributed on the, on the chat. Um, and so here we have a couple of resources on how to pre-register, obviously um, some language assistance information, um, some vaccine FAQs, um, where you can really take a look at the, the facts and evidence base that Delara mentioned, information or vaccines. We also shared here an HHS COVID-19 community corpse resource. We'll, where you will get resources to help you build vaccine confidence in your communities, such as facts, fact sheets on vaccine safety, tips on how to talk with friends and family about the importance of vaccination. Um, so thank you all. Please feel free to look in the chat and ensure that you save those resources for your back pocket. Um, and next slide, please. And lastly, the University of Maryland is hosting a public health research at Maryland next week from April 13th to the 15th. The events plan theme is exactly what we talked about today. Learning from 2020 to advance public public's health aims to reflect and build on lessons learned from 2020 related to COVID-19, social and racial injustice, climate change and more. We have included the registration and the chat as well. Um, this is a free event, so feel free to attend. So again, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you to our moderator, to our panelists, and to each and one of you for your time with us this evening. Um, with that, I, our panelists, do you all have any additional closing comments before we end today's event? Thank you for this invitation. Uh, thank you for everyone who participated and for uh, MDPHA for sponsoring this. This has been terrific. Uh, it was great to hear the stories. You've given me some uh, additional things to think about and for us to do here. Um, thank you again very much for sponsoring this and go Vax. And I am just adding um, all of the links to the chat. I apologize for the delay, but they are all there now. Fantastic. And thank you to the, again, to the Maryland uh, Public Health Association for this event and to all of the participants uh, who contributed their questions um, and to the panelists who shared all of their experiences and their insights and their knowledge, um, much appreciated. And very much like my fellow uh, public health person, um, you've given me much to think about. Thank you.